We have had three, maybe four, I think three messages here in chapter 10. Again, this is, uh, has extended on from chapter 8. I'll just hit some points of reference in that in, by way of review as we go forward here. But uh, I'll start by reading our text, verse 24 down to verse 33. We'll have a word of prayer and then get into our lesson this evening. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 24, Let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. Whatsoever is sold in the shambles, that eat, asking no question for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. If any of them that believe not bid you to a feast, and ye be disposed to go, whatsoever is set before you, eat, asking no question for conscience sake. But if any man say unto you, this is offered in sacrifice unto idols, eat not for his sake that showed it, and for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Conscience, I say, not thine own, but of the other. For why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? For if I by grace be a partaker, why am I evil spoken of for that for which I give thanks? Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God, even as I please all men in all things, not seeking mine own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. Let's pray. Father, you're a father of wisdom. You provide us wisdom in Christ. We've learned already from this epistle that you made Christ to be unto us wisdom. And in that wisdom and by that wisdom, Father, we are able to make judgments. Judgments that follow the pattern of Scripture, the spirit that your word sets forth, that we might do all things to your honor and glory. Father, we thank you for what you've put in your word, that we might be educated, that we might be edified, and we might have some principles in which to look at and be able to prove in the details of our own lives. We thank you for the instruction set forth here in chapter 10 that we might be able to further restrain our liberty not only for the weaker brother, but for the unbeliever as well. That we might have a testimony that appeals to their conscience, to their glory, to your glory, and for their profit. So we give you all the thanks and praise for this godly charity that you provide us. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you just turn back with me really quick to 1 Corinthians chapter 8, I want you to just quickly to glance at these opening three verses. It seems like we were just here, but it's been some time. And if you look at verse 1, he says, Not as touching things offered unto idols, We know, I'm sorry, now as touching things offered on idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. And then he went on and he talked about and discussed the issue of the knowledge of the one God and how that is, um, how that gives them the liberty, the freedom to, to know that the idol is nothing. They can eat that which is offered on the idols. However, the weaker brother doesn't have that conscience. They don't have that in their conscience so when they see you eating, when they would see the Corinthians eating those meats offered to idols, their conscience was weak. That's what makes them the weaker brother. And therefore, they would wound their weak conscience. They would sin against their brother. Their brother would perish. Uh, they would sin against Christ. They, um, and, and a whole host of, of things. And then in chapter 9, he defended his apostleship. He described these powers that he has, every right, and ones that are legitimate powers to exercise and there would be no question in regards to his ability to do that and his rightful place to do that but yet he restrains those things for the profitability of the Corinthians that they might be edified he described the authority that he has in the dispensation of the gospel that was committed unto him and yet he is servant unto all that he might gain the more chapter 9 verse 19 and then, as we got into, and then he, at the end of that chapter, he described uh, the process of doing this as this race that we run, but not to obtain a corruptible, corruptible crown, 
but an incorruptible crown. And so therefore he keeps his body uh, in subjection in regards to that godly charity. And then he says, moreover, in chapter 10, and he's going to even expound even further on this matter, not to lust after evil things. And he talked about uh, how the things that God did with Israel when they came out of Egypt were our examples not to lust after evil things, that God has uh, put us in a position that we're able to bear these temptations that are common to men. And then he described to them how they need to judge as wise men concerning what's going on when they partake in these temples. It's not that the idol is anything. It's not that the meat offered to idols is anything. It's that they do it to devils. And Paul would not have them to have fellowship with devils. And then he is now going to give us, as we just read, some practical judgments that can be made in a situation with the, the unbeliever. He's dealt with the weaker brother. Uh, if you look, since we're, uh, well, I'm still on chapter 8 here on the screen. If I go all the way down, if you remember in verse 13, the weaker brother says, Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend... I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. So he talks about this, how, uh, how this knowledge is not supposed to puff them up, but they're supposed to have charity to edify. And in edifying them, they wouldn't eat. They would forego their liberty to eat that which was offered to idols for the sake of their brother. This is charity. It's to edify them. It's to build them up. Now, in chapter 10, he's not going to deal with the weaker brother. He's going to deal with the unbeliever. If you look at uh, chapter 10 here, let me pull it up here on the screen. Chapter 10, and specifically, if you look at verse 27, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 27. Come on. Well, you see it there. He says, if any of them that believe not bid you to a feast. So those that are believers bid you to a feast. How are you to respond? And what's a fascinating thing is to look at how Paul describes, gives some instruction in regards to how you are to respond. And it's not black and white. In other words, it isn't, well, this is how you should respond every single time. It's based on some things that are taking place in the conscience of the unbeliever and how you know what's taking place based upon what they say. And so that's what we're going to look at here tonight. And Paul would conduct himself in a fashion in such a way to appeal to the conscience for their spiritual prophet to set forth the testimony of God and his authority and, and who he is and the knowledge of the one God, and, but also to God's honor and glory, therefore. So let's look at verse 24, if you will. He says, after getting done talking about in verse 23, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. It is lawful for them to eat the meat offered on idols, but it's not expedient. It's not the most excellent thing that they could do. So you're not talking about good, better, best. You're talking about things that are excellent, expedient. The, the, the best thing that you could do in this situation. It says, all things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. This is, this is an opportunity now. The liberty that they have is an opportunity now to not utilize it as occasion for themselves, but by love serve one another. And therefore, in that love, in serving one another, edify them, build them up. So he says here in verse 24, it says, let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. It says, let no man seek his own. Don't seek his own profit. If you go down through these verses, you see the issue here is the issue of their, their profit. Again, we looked at verse 33. He says, if even as I please all men in all things, not seeking mine own profit, but the profit of many. So he's talking about a certain kind of profit, a, a certain kind of wealth, a certain kind of value system here. And the, the value system, the wealth here, is not physical, but it's internal. 
It's a spiritual prophet. And you know that because of what he's going to say here. Uh, just look at the next verse, verse 25. He says, Whatsoever is sold in the shambles, that eat, asking no question for what? Conscience sake. What Paul's got in the mind is the wealth, the profit of the unbelievers or this individual's conscience. Now, when you first read it, you think he's talking about their conscience or, or his own conscience. But as you go down, you see that it's verse 27. Conscience, I say, not thine own, but of the other. He's got the other's conscience. That makes sense, right? When he says, let no man seek his own, he's not thinking about his own conscience, for he's got some knowledge already that is the, the modus operandi of his conscience. You, you op, your conscience operates upon what you believe. And what you believe is based upon knowledge, is based upon information. And so he's not talking about his own conscience. He's talking about but every man another's wealth, their wealthy conscience. And so he says in connection with this issue that he's brought up, idolatry, and that which is offered unto, idol, uh, unto idols, he says, whatsoever is sold in the shambles. The shambles were basically the place in which they were kind of like a marketplace, as it were. They would go and offer their, their meats offered unto idols, and then the, which was left over, they would take the shambles and it would be sold, and people would go and buy it, and, and they would eat it. Now, someone who would go to the shambles, you could, in one sense, assume that some of it, but maybe not all of it, was offered unto idols. And so Paul's coming along and saying here, based upon their liberty, whatsoever sold in the shambles, that eat. Asking no question for conscience sake. You don't have to ask a question. You don't have to come along and say, hey, was this offered on the idols? No, you can, you can simply, if, if, if it's just come along and they're, they're selling it and you can just go make that transaction and you can buy it, you can eat it. Now if you're a weaker brother, and all that is coming around, well, you might want to be a little more careful based upon the, the wisdom and the judgments given earlier on in, in chapter, chapter 8. But in connection with this, not even in, in, in connection with the weaker brother, but, but based upon the situation, eat. You, can eat. you can eat it. You don't have to ask a question. You don't have to wonder if it is or isn't. And he says, for, for conscience' sake. Why? For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. It's all the Lord's, right? He made every animal. In fact, look at 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. In verse 1. Bring it up here. He says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats. So there are going to be some who teach and command to abstain from meats. Now Paul will do that based upon certain situations for another man's wealth, for another man's conscience. For their spiritual benefit. These men are teaching it and commanding it. And that is, uh, that's, a, that's a doctrine of the devil, he says. It says, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. So those that have the knowledge of the one God and they believe that, they are, have been set apart to be received by those who believe and know the truth with thanksgiving. He says, for every creature of God is good. That's the issue, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Now, the specific creatures here he's talking about is not necessarily, you know, a spider. You probably don't want to, I mean, if you had to, maybe you had to eat, you, you'd eat a spider. But he's not talking about, you know, spiders. This is all a, this is all a biblical context. So the, the specific ones he's talking about here, and you're, you're going to see this here in a sec. He says, he says, and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the what? Word of God. These, there are some specific creatures that were not sanctified, were not set apart, were not clean for man to eat or God's people to eat at a certain point in time. And we've gone there before. Leviticus chapter 11, camel, coney, the swine, and the hare uh, were just some of the animals that were unclean that they were not to eat 
under the law, based upon the ordinances of the law. Well, that's all changed. And we see that with, uh, with Peter there in Acts chapter 10 and that sheet coming down with all those animals and the Lord saying, rise, uh, Peter, uh, kill and eat. And he says, I have not eaten anything unclean. And uh, that happens to him three times and he realizes that uh, what God has made uh, uh, called clean, uh, then, it's, then it's clean. And don't call anything that God has made clean unclean. And there's more significance to that in regards to the dispensational change and God dealing with the Gentiles. However, it's still a truth in regards to God has sanctified those certain thing, uh, animals that were not sanctified in the ordinance of the law. He now has. And they're not to be refused, as it were. They can be received with thanksgiving, for they're sanctified by the word of God in prayer. It's one of the things that uh, we introduced when we pray before our meals we used to always say bless this food to nourish our bodies and then we kind of felt a little convicted about that when we were out eating McDonald's well we don't eat McDonald's too much more but when we eat things that we really know don't nourish our bodies I mean if we're if we're honest uh, but we do know that even if it is that McDonald's that uh, uh, you know, or whatever it might be, or that breakfast sausage, that pork or bacon, uh, you know, that I like on my burgers and all those kind of things, it's sanctified by the Word of God in prayer. In the Old Testament, the ordinance of the law, that wouldn't be the case. Wouldn't be allowed to eat that to please God. And uh, so we recognize not only the dispensational change, but what God has done in connection with what we can eat. And we can receive it with thanksgiving. And so you have a passage here in regards to the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And in connection with the fullness thereof, he can come along and say to his people, this is unclean to you at this point in time, and this is clean to you at this point in time. And that's what he's done throughout history. And we're at that point now in history, uh, at, once again, in which we can eat those, those, those meats that they could not. So turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I'll pull it up here. And so you can do that. You can the thing the meats sold in the in the shambles there, that eat. They may or may not be off, uh, have been offered and sacrificed on the idols, but the issue is you can eat them. And before the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And then he says, if any any of them that believe not, so an unbeliever now, bids you to a feast. So they invite you to a feast. He says, and ye be disposed to go. You're, you're inclined to go. You desire to go to this feast that they're having. They arrange it. They've placed it. And you're, gonna, you're, gonna, you're set in order to go to it. He says, whatsoever is set before you, Eat, asking no question for conscience sake. So just like when uh, they were sold in the shambles and you, and you bought it, you don't need to ask a question uh, for conscience sake. Your conscience is fine. Their, their, their conscience is, it is what it is, as it were. And he says, ask no question and you can eat it. You can eat it. By the way, this is, what, this is what was going on. This is why he brought up the weaker brother. Because they would go to the feast, but not only were they there, or something like that, a weaker brother was there. And the weaker brother would be uh, emboldened to eat based upon your liberty to eat. And so you have both issues remain you just have to be more discerning in regards to who's there and who's not there, the situation, the circumstance. You're taking all this into consideration. This is what uh, the spirit-filled life is about in regards to taking the word of God, identifying the situation, the circumstance, who's there, what's coming out of their mouth, um, and, and, and what's going on. And here's the case where you're at a feast with a whole bunch of unbelievers, and you're eating things, and uh, you're not, you don't need to ask a question because you have the knowledge, your, your conscience is fine, you have that liberty, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. But then you, this happens, verse 28. But if any man say unto you, any of those unbelievers say unto you, this is offered in sacrifice unto idols. Now, based upon what's come out of their mouth, the course of action is going to change. 
You see that? It's, it's going to be, it's not, that you're, it's not that you're initiating this by coming along and asking them a question about if it was offered on idols. It doesn't always have to be that way. Sometimes Christians want to be that way in regards to some uh, uh, small issues. They want to always just come out and, and look different as it were. And that's not the case. You don't always have to do that. However, if, they're, if, if they come along and they, they bring this, and it's not even a question here, it's just a de- declarative statement, this is offered in sacrifice unto idols. He says that. Now you are responsive to that to appeal to their conscience. Because if someone says that, Really, what's, what's behind that? If someone comes along and you're sitting down and you're eating, what's most likely in their mind? One, that they're maybe devoted, or two, and or two, they know that you don't believe in what they believe, that they believe in this God and you believe in the God. And so what are they doing? Trying to arouse you, they're trying to test you, trying to prove you. And what happens, therefore, not based upon the meat itself, not based upon the idol it was offered unto, but based upon what he says and what's taking place in his conscience. That's why he's saying, seek every man another's wealth. That's what he's looking at. Now, he has every liberty to eat. He's got the freedom, we have the freedom to eat. We just, we just saw that. But he's, he's going to say, eat not. Don't eat it. Wait, Paul, you just said I could eat it. You could eat it when he asked no question. But now he's brought up this statement and he said, this is offered in idols. And so now you're going to go to work and you're going to seek out their wealth. It's not that he wasn't before. Most likely he's at a, a, you're most likely at a feast, although the Corinthians oftentimes were, but you're at a feast with an unbeliever to what? To, to, to witness to them, to, to be able to have an opportunity to share the gospel. And now maybe he has, maybe he hasn't, uh, but at this, at, in, in this situation, they come along and they've initiated, they brought it up, they're sharing what they believe. So how do you respond? You just sit back and let it, let it happen? Well, you got the freedom, but you're going to restrain that freedom. You're going to restrain that liberty for their profit. Now, how they respond is not the issue. It's what you're doing in regards to the profitability and the wealth system of their conscience based upon the knowledge of God that you have. So he says, eat not for his sake, that showed it. See, that's what he wants, that's what he wants to do. He wants to, he wants to show it. And this most likely isn't, hey, hey, this, this, was, this was offered on the idols. This was in front of everyone. This is sacrificed on the idols. This is, this is his, his benediction and his prayer before their meal, as it were. I just want you to all know, thank you for joining me at this feast. This is sacrificed unto our God. Our gods. It was sacrificed in the temple of whatever. He showed it. And he says, for his sake, don't eat it. You have his wealth. You have his profit in mind. You're going to conduct yourself in charity towards him. Even though it might not look like it, you are towards him and in God's sight. He says, and for conscience sake. Why? For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And it's not so much there, the issue of you can eat whatever you want. It's the issue of the emphasis is not for the earth is for uh, for the earth and the fullness. It, It is for the earth is the Lord's. He's Lord. And so now you're taking that issue and you're not looking at that issue in so much that in your freedom to eat, you're looking at in connection with, I believe in the one Lord. And they just came along and said, no, there's another Lord. Remember when he said that back there in chapter 8? 
He says, uh, for they be called God's many and Lord's many, verse 5 of chapter 8. Well, now he's coming along and he's emphasizing that for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And so you're not going to eat because you belong to the Lord. And he just already, he's already established in verse 21. I'm sorry, verse 20. But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice the devils and not to God. And I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. So now you're at this feast. In one sense, you are fellowshipping. But now that he said something, the issue is, are you going to fellowship to that extent and not make the impact that you're supposed to and take that fellowship to the level in which you shouldn't take it? And what's going to end up happening is if you do, there's going to be consequences in regards to their conscience. Look at, look at some of that here with me really quick in verse 29. I guess we'll just go down anyways. He says, Conscience, I say, not thine own, but of the other. For why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? And how is it going to be judged? Verse 30. For if I by grace be a partaker, why am I evil spoken of for that which I give thanks? Why should I be, why should someone speak evil about me when I have the liberty to eat this because of what, what's going on in their conscience. In their conscience, it would be, they understand that it would be an evil thing for you because you believe in this God and they believe in that God. And if you eat with them, you're coming along and you're saying you believe what they believe in one, S, in one sense. And so he says, don't eat. This is a, I don't know about you, this is, a, this is a tremendous passage. It is profound. And it comes along and it gives another hallmark feature of that charity issue. And what charity looks like with the unbeliever. In some cases it might act this way, in some cases it might act this way and in response to what is said in response to what is done it acts in such a way that appeals to their conscience and here they said this thing is offered in sacrifice on idols it says don't eat it don't eat it for their conscience conscience I say not thine own but of the other by not eating now because he's attached to it this thing is offered in sacrifice on idols by not eating now, what, what are you doing? By not eating, you're coming along and saying, no, there is the Lord. The earth is the Lord's in the, fu the, in the fullness thereof. And that you might believe what you believe, but I'm, 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 I'm standing in regards to God. You're, you're, you're testifying to the truthfulness of that knowledge that there is one God. And, and you're doing it in face of what they've said, maybe not even necessarily by saying anything, but by not partaking in eating. By not partaking in eating. He says, for why, again, conscious I say, not thine own, but the other. For why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? Why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience when I can simply not eat? And now, my liberty isn't judged. I'm no, longer, I'm no longer judged in that negative way. If there's any judgment, it's in regard to things that they probably knew about me anyways. Or if they didn't, in regards to, maybe they ask, well, why aren't you eating? Because I believe that there is one God. That's the Lord. And let me tell you about him. Now, now, you, now, you, now you've just provided an entry into what you believe and an opportunity to maybe to share. Verse 30, for their good, for their good. Verse 30, for if I by grace be a partaker, why am I evil spoken of for that for which I give thanks? He said, don't, don't do that. Don't be evil spoken of. Maintain that testimony. Maintain that testimony, how? By ref refraining, restraining your liberty. You do have a liberty, but why, why have your liberty evil spoken of? 
Why be judged of another man's conscience? When you can give it up, and you can give it up, and it's not only when you're going to give it up, but at the very same time, it's for their profit. It's for their wealth. And so he says in verse 31, Whether therefore ye eat, or drink, or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. That is a very important principle. The chief man is essentially to glorify God. It's to glorify God. Well, how do we glorify God? We've just, given a, just been given a, a passage that explains how to do that in this situation as well as to do it in this situation. When you glorify God, you extol Him, you elevate Him in the conscience of others based upon what you say, when you say it, how you do something, when you do it. It's based upon taking the wisdom of God's Word and proving it in the details of your life. And here we get an example of that. In a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a judgment sense in regards to, this isn't a, again, black or white. It's based upon the conscience of someone else and what's going on within them. Come with me to Romans chapter 14. Get Romans chapter 14. Now this, in Romans chapter 14, he's talking about the weaker brother. But I want you to some, notice some similarities here. Pick it up in verse 13. He says, Let us not therefore judge one another any more, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. But if any brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not, what? Charitably. Destroy, and, and, and if you were to partake when the unbeliever said that this thing is offered in sacrifice on idols, you, you would know if you were to eat and exercise your liberty in that and not extol the knowledge of the one God, you're no longer walking charitably. You're walking according to your own liberties. See, it's, it's not just that we've been given all this freedom and liberty in Christ and we're just to come along and, and stand upon it and, and exercise it and wave it in the, in the eyes of everyone else. It's the issue of I'll even refrain those things for your good. Because that's what charity does. It says, destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. Let not then your good be evil spoken of. Don't let, don't let your good, isn't that the same issue? Don't let your good be evil spoken of. I got the liberty to eat. Why should I be, why is my liberty judged? Verse 17, for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Do you see the, the imbalance it's not in meat and drink. If you're, if you're going to come along and, and, and stand upon your liberty to eat that which is just said, this is offered to idols, and you're not going to ref restrain that for the sake of uh, giving them a testimony of God, something's misfiring. Something's misfiring. One, you're coming along and looking too much at yourself, and secondarily, you're not glorifying God to the level you should because you should be concerned about their spiritual wealth, their spiritual profit, not enjoying this food at this moment in time. And that's what the comparison is with the weaker brother too. Me injuring compared to righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Which one's spiritual? The latter. The latter. It says, for he, I want you to pick this up here, verse 18. For he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God. So when you serve Christ in these things by restraining your liberties that you have in Christ, in your dispensational position in Christ, when you give them up for the sake of another and walk us therefore charitably, it's acceptable to God. But not only that, look what he says. And approved of who? Approved of men. 
there's an element to this where men will approve of you because you are you are standing for what you believe in. Well, you say, well, I believe that I can eat anything. Well, you can. But eating something isn't always the, the thing you should stand upon to elevate and glorify God. What you should stand upon is the, 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 the issue of who God is in the face of who they believe. That's a stronger position. That's a stronger stance. And it can approve you among men because of your stance. There's some respectability there. They might not believe what you believe. They might not be all happy, joy, joy in connection with, with what you are standing upon. But there can be an approving that goes on. He says, let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. For meat destroy not the work of God. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man who eateth with offense. Now come back over to chapter 10 of 1 Corinthians. Actually, we're going to go one other place. Just glance there at verse 31 again. He says it. Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do. So it's not only, this isn't only applicable in this issue of eating and drinking. It's in whatsoever you do. Whatsoever ye do. Whatsoever ye do. Do all to the glory of God. There are countless, countless situations and circumstances throughout a given day in regards to things that you do that you can give glory to God. You might even not even know it, but that what appeals and it sets forth that testimony of God to the conscience of unbelievers and those that are, that are around you. How you conduct yourself and what you say, when you say it, and how you say it, and what you do, when you do it, and who you do it to. Based upon in response maybe to what they've said Look at Colossians, Colossians chapter 3. Pick it up here in verse 12. He says, Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies. When you choose to Prove God's mercy towards you to someone else. Kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long suffering. These are all the spiritual merchandise that we have to spend on the wealth of someone else. Forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also you are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Jump down to verse 17. He says, And whatsoever ye do, there's this catch-all phrase again, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, because that's whose name you bear. Giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. That's why he says over in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 there, he says in verse 18, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Why? Why in everything should I give thanks when not everything feels good to me? Because in everything you can seek someone else's wealth. And it can be for their good. It can be it work together for good. Because it's not about us. Well, it is about us. But it's about us being about others. This is the, the modus operandi of, of what God's doing today by the effectual working of God's word within us. It's to cultivate, it's to build us up and edify us in his love that we might 
by our word and by our deed, appeal to others' conscience for the sake of sharing the gospel and for the sake of edifying them so that they would get some knowledge, that they would get some understanding by what we do. Sometimes this is taken for granted, especially in the, in the grace camp, and not understand the proper place for good works in regards to what those good works are for. Why Paul would say in, in Titus chapter 3 there, why he would, uh, he would come along and say, this is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly that, that they which have believed in God might be careful, full of care, to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto you. Is that what he says? No, unto men. Good works aren't profitable unto me. Not the good works we're supposed to be engaged in. The good works we're supposed to be engaged in are not for our sakes, but they're for the sakes of others. They're for the conscience of others. They're profitable to them. That's what a good work does. It's thinking of others. And so Paul's coming along and explain, explain. And by the way, sometimes when we think about what's good for them, it's not looking at what's good for them based upon what they think is good for them. What this man here, when he says this thing is offered and sacrificed on, on the idols, what, what would we would evaluate and judge what would be good for him is to sh maybe be quiet and eat it because uh, he invited us to his house. This is, this is his home, Right? And, and it's good for me just not to say anything. And that's not what he says. That's not looking out for his, his wealth. Because it's not the issue of his house. It's the issue of his inner man. Come with me over to Proverbs. This is a, this is a principle in scripture that really comes out in this dispensation of God's grace. Look at Proverbs um, chapter 3. Proverbs 3. And look at verse 13. He says, Happy is the man that findeth wisdom, and the man that getteth understanding, for the merchandise of it. Now what is merchandise? Saleable goods. Saleable goods. And how do you get that? How do you get those goods? Sorry. <laughs> how do you get those goods? Being wise, but when we talk about in a world in a world system, work, work, and then what do you got to work? And you get some money, right? And you take that money and you go buy something, and you get what? You get some merchandise, right? Um, my wife and I, uh, for Christmas, we got uh, tickets to go see a Timberwolves game. We went to a Timberwolves game. And we went to the to the store and got. Uh, some merchandise. We picked up some things, uh, some little keychain things for Abigail and, and Josiah. Went to, we went and bought some merchandise, right? The T Timberwolves merchandise. And we took the money that we earned and we came along and we spent it. And we got some merchandise. But if you think about this spiritually, the, the wisdom, he says, happy is the man that findeth wisdom and, and the man that getteth understanding. He's, he's happy and because he's getting wisdom and he's getting understanding. Why? Because he can get some merchandise with it. He says, for the merchandise of it is better than the merchandise of silver. It's better than the silver that you could take and go spend in this world. The wisdom and the understanding that God's word, in, in this passage, the Father gives to the Son. The merchandise of that wisdom and the understanding that the son can get from exercising it and spending it is better than the merchandise that the son can get if he, if his if he took his father's inheritance in silver and went and spent it and got some earthly goods. We know that. The prodigal son, right? Went out and just spent it and lavished uh, uh, um, it on, on the things of the world until it was all spent. He didn't come out to be too happy. And the gain thereof than fine gold. 
She is more precious than rubies. And all the things thou canst desire are not to be compared unto her. Now what's interesting is right away in the immediate context, it doesn't come along and say, well, what is the merchandise? It doesn't say that. It says, get wisdom, get understanding, because you'll be happy once you do, because the merchandise of it is better. But what's the merchandise? Well, you learn that best of all in Paul's epistles. The merchandise is the edification of someone else. It's taking everything that you've found and that you've gotten from God's word that you have begin now to spend on someone else for their profit, for their spiritual wealth, for their salvation when you share with them the gospel, and for, for their edification for those that, that, that believe. I'm always astounded. I remember... It was a couple years back. I got an email from a man in, uh, I believe it was New York. Never met the man, didn't know, didn't know the man. I, I, might have, I might have emailed him a couple times prior to that, but he emailed me and he said, by listening to your messages, I clearly understand now and believe that I am not saved by any works of my own, but by grace, through faith, and it's through your preaching that I have become saved. <laughs> What? Like, really? Like, it's one thing when you go out and you share the gospel with someone, and then you don't get a response, or, you know, they're on the fence about it, and you, you just kind of really don't know. But for someone to write out and acknowledge that obviously it's God who saved them, but that you're a vessel to share that, and say, so, I mean, I remember I, shared, I read that to my wife, and I just, I, cry, I couldn't believe it. I, wow, Really? And then when, when I get the emails that come along and say, hey, we know we're not physically a part of your ministry, but we, we're constantly following you on Facebook, on YouTube, and um, we are just been so edified. I just got, I just got one uh, a, couple, uh, last, a couple weeks ago saying, hey, I started through Romans, and I'm caught up with you guys now. I went through all the lessons in Romans. All the lessons in Romans. They, they went through 500 and some. They're, they've caught up to where we're at. It's possible. How, and it's just, and, and I know now, I know so much more now than when, prior when I started regarding my justification, regarding my sanctification, and walking after the Spirit, and, 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 and all the things that you've been teaching recently, Romans 9, 10, and I'm just, I, I, I get speechless. I just can't believe it. And it's for their spiritual wealth. And the same thing goes on, even though you don't get acknowledged for it, but when I'm at work, and someone comes along and does something in contradiction because they know I'm a pastor, in what is my stance going to be? Am I just going to compromise? Or am I going to make a stand? Not just make a stand just for the stand's sake, but for their conscience. So that they can know, you've just, you just open, I look at it now as, and I don't, I'm not perfect in it, but I look at it now as you open the door for me now to go walk right through it. I, w I, wasn't, I didn't say anything to you, I didn't bring it up, you have brought it up, and now it's a door for me to go right into, and here we go. And I get to now appeal to their conscience. And that's the merchandise right there. That's what we have to start getting our minds around in regards to walking after the Spirit and receiving the things of the Spirit and begin to prove them. That's where we're going to be at in Romans chapter 12. Prove them in the details of our life. We're taking all these principles that we're learning and we're doing it to the glory of God, affecting people spiritually, their conscience. That's why he's going to say in regards to the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. We bring every thought captive, every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. He's not necessarily, he's talking about himself, but he's talking about everyone he comes in counter with. He's, he's, every, every person he comes in counter with, there's a stronghold. And you, and you look at that and you think, okay, well, that's not a very big deal. And he says, 
this warfare is greater than a physical warfare because eternal life is on the line and their eternal reward is on the line. Gain or loss at the judgment seat of Christ and eternal doom or eternal life is on the line. And so he says, this war is the greatest war you could ever partake of. That's why God is giving you the, the full armor of God. And that's why he says, our wep we have weapons in which we pull down those strongholds. We, we go into their conscience and we pull it down. And we replace it with the pillar and ground of the truth. Because we are the pillar and ground of the truth. We're the church. And so he says, this merchandise, these, this is more precious than rubies. And you think, man, it just doesn't really make sense. Well, one, usually sometimes it doesn't make sense because we put so much stock into stock. Put so much stock into things. We put so much stock into uh, uh, money and houses. And it's not that we don't have to, we need those things, and those things are a part of life, but we put so much value and esteem into it to where we don't begin to see the real value spiritually. And therefore, we have to constantly stir it up when we wake up in the morning. And we think about what we're going to encounter, what we're going to be a, a part of, and, and what we know, and what we've learned. And, and are we counting that more precious than rubies, than the things that we purchase, the things that we buy? And do we look at it as all things that thou canst desire are not to be compared unto her? And the second reason why we don't do that is because we don't understand this, who, this is who God is. God doesn't look at God doesn't look at the earth and the heaven although they're, they 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 testify to his him being creator and he doesn't he, he doesn't come along and say oh yeah this is this is so wonderful and and glorify me by it there's there's part of that there and those kind of things but that's not the end all be all he doesn't even look at man in the sense and, and the nations and all these kind of things that have, have been derived from whom he first made, Adam and Eve. But what does he look at? He looks at why he created man. He created man to, the, to install and instill his mind and his heart in that earthen vessel that we might be like him. And being like him is in love and charity, giving of ourselves. And when he sees that, he says, that's more precious. That's at the judgment seat of Christ. What we do out of his godly charity towards other is what is going to be tried. Is it there? Does it exist? And has it been proved? And if not, there will be loss because everything therefore then is just after the, the flesh. It's not going to be a very good thing. And this, is, this has been one of the things that I've been thinking about in regards to my ministry. It's not going to be a very good thing for someone to go up there at the judgment seat of Christ and come along and say, well, I knew right division. And I knew I wasn't supposed to be water baptized. And I knew that I could eat all the meats that I could. And I knew I could do this. And I knew I could do that. And I knew I could do that. And he would say, okay, that's good. But what about your wife? How'd you love your wife like I love the church? What about your children? And the instruction I gave, how about in your work? How did you do all things to my glory? Well, well, I knew I'm not water, I knew I wasn't supposed to get water baptized. That's how some grace believers are. They hang on all these things that, yes, in one aspect are essential, but on another sense, in regards to certain things, it's, it's, a, it's an issue, it's a, it's a non-essential in regards to godly charity. You can, you can take that knowledge and it can puff you up so much that you shove it in someone's face and you're not charitable at all. You're not really concerned about your edification. You're concerned about, I'm right and you're wrong. Or how about sharing those truths in a loving manner? Being meek there's a big difference there's a big difference and that's what these passages are designed to effectually work within us 
I remember when I got in the right division, I just... And you know what? We left, but it did no good. It did absolutely nothing. Do you know what has? I've gone back to some of those people and I said, I'm sorry, I shared, with it. I shared that with you in such a horrible way. I still believe the things that I believed back then, but if I wanted you to believe them, that was no way in which I've shared them with. Now we can have a conversation. Now my conversation can be winsome towards them. We'll come back over to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 as we wind down here. Again, verse 31. He says, what, what, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. That's a skill that you learn through the word of God. Verse 32. Give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. That's why you see Paul doing some of these things over here that you think, wow, that's... Really According to right division, Paul, that's, that's very questionable. Why in the world would you do that? Because charity. You, you would take Timothy and circumcise him? Paul, what are you thinking? Circumcision availeth nothing. You're absolutely right. But I can utilize it for their spiritual wealth. And Timothy is involved in it. Timothy doesn't do that thing blindly. He knows exactly what he's doing. You knew to, to get access into that group and those kind of things. You, you, you're circumcised and then and showing that. And then they can come along and say, hey, that meant nothing. I, I would do that. Timothy would do that at that age. For their spiritual gain. And that's why it's so hard for some folks when they're rightly divided to see Paul's Acts ministry there, and they're thinking, what in the world is he? What in the world is he doing? Why is he doing this? Why is he doing that? Is right division. Come on, Paul. What are you doing? Oh, we'll, just, we'll forget Paul right here. Let's get him after Acts twenty-eight. No, no, don't do that. It's just you're missing the points. The point is that he, yes, he was the he was the first member of the body of Christ. But as he was, he was seeking out to gain them, we already learned that in chapter 9 in regards to he's free from all men, yet I myself serve it unto all, that I might gain the more unto the Jews that became a Jew, and that I might gain the Jews to them that are under the law as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law to them without the law as without the law. To the weak became I weak, that I might gain the weak. I made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. That's what Paul's doing. That's what it means to do all to the glory of God. Give no offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. And he says, verse 33, even as I please all men in all things, not seeking mine own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. The very thing that he's just explained there is parallel to the issue of pleasing all men in all things. That's why he, in, in some regards he's approved of men, in some regards he's not. And we'll read that in 2 Corinthians. Doing good, but yet evil spoken of, and all these kind of things. Not seeking mine own profit. So he said there in verse 24, not let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. And he says, verse 33, but the profit of many that they, these many, that they may be saved. That's the bottom line for Paul when he's dealing with an unbeliever. God's will is that all men become saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. The will be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And so how he conducts himself, by the way, when he says please all men here, this isn't that he's, he's compromising and sin and, 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 and these kind of things. It's, it's, not the, it's not the issue of being a men pleaser like he talks about in some sense. Uh, if you read over there in Galatians chapter 1, he brings up, um, he says in verse 10, he says, For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. 
And so you have two issues here. It's, it's not that he's compromising doctrine, but in his conduct, as much as lieth in him, he lives peaceably with all men for their profit. And when a situation like this is, arises, even though he makes that stance, it's for their spiritual wealth. Why? Because now he's just maintained the stance that there's only one God, his God. And if so happens to be that they can have a conversation that they might become saved. If he shuts up and he doesn't eat, he doesn't make that impact, he's not that influencing vessel, then that door might not be there. God has given us the privilege in many cases to open doors. Not just wait for a door to open. You've heard that expression before. But to open doors. We open doors because we have the authority and we have the supreme wisdom, the spiritual understanding of all things that Paul's ministry grants us and the wisdom given to him. Well, Next week we'll begin again in chapter 11 and we'll look at these ordinances in regards to some things that were taking place with the covering of the women's hair. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time to look into your word and a profound passage like this that really sheds light on the activity that ought to be going on in our inner man in regards to situations, circumstances of life and certain actions that we are to take based upon a response to something said or all carefully chosen to appeal to the conscience of another for their spiritual profit that they might be saved or come to the knowledge of the truth if, they're, if they are saved. And in this situation, Father, it would be the issue of restraining your liberty. And although we would be, by grace, a partaker of this meat that was offered on idols, we wouldn't do it for the sake of the other man's conscience based upon how they're viewing things, based upon what they understand. We are able to maneuver within their conscience and appeal to it and to make an influence upon it in regards to the truth. What a position of strength you've put us in. Father, you provide for us to be that vessel that serves as a light that shines in dark hearts. May we not only look at it as a provision, but may we read your word, therefore, study it, get into it, and have it effectually work in us, and therefore have that power that it is at our disposal for your honor and glory. For truly all things that we are to do, we are, all, we are to do it all to the glory of God. We thank you for this time. We thank you for everyone here, everyone listening. And we pray if they have not trusted the gospel or believed the gospel, how that Christ died for their sins, was buried, and rose again, that they would believe this very moment, receive the forgiveness of their sins, past, present, and future. For it is by faith and faith alone that no works can save them, and no works can, they can add to their faith in order to receive eternal life is faith and faith alone. And the moment they believe, all their sins will be forgiven. Past, present, and future, and your righteousness will be imputed unto them. And they will therefore immediately possess that gift, that gift of eternal life. And they believe this very moment. We thank you for this time of grace giving in Christ's name. Amen.